and welcome to Wednesday in the Word. Thank you for uh, taking some time to uh, fellowship around the Word uh, as we do every week at this time. Uh, we're appreciative of that. Pastor Kevin here with Joyce Ann off to my right, who's waving at you right there. So wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Tonight is, um, well, we're continuing on in our ongoing series, Journey Through Revelation. We are in chapter, or not chapter, pardon me, uh, lesson number eight tonight. And this happens to be Wednesday in the Word for Wednesday, February the 2nd, 2022. So yeah, we're already in the second month of the year. And uh, so there you go for that. We, uh, we I tell you, uh, time just goes by quickly. And so... Uh, when we're having fun. When we're having fun, yes. You bet. And uh, it's cold again. You know, I, I know I've been saying that just about every week. Maybe I should say it's cold yet. It's cold still. Maybe that'd be the better way to say it. We, we saw a young man out to uh, our local Walmart here today, and he said that uh, he thought that spring couldn't come quickly enough. And I uh, explained to him, you know, that the groundhog, uh -uh. who, by the way, uh, speaking of the groundhog, I found out today, I was doing some reading, and according to the Farmer's Almanac, and I don't know how many years this runs back, I don't know that, that number, but according to the, the, the Farmer's Almanac, I want to say in the last 10 years, I think that was the figure, that the groundhog has been right only 38% of the time. So, you know, that's encouraging. So anyway... <laughs> Anyway, so whatever that's worth. A good evening to Nancy there, who was with us, who had uh, chatted in. We see our sister Brenda there. Uh, good evening. She says, yes, it's freezing. In fact, we uh, around here, and I imagine it goes pretty much across the state, we have a wind chill advisory uh, in effect for tomorrow. So yeah, so there you go for that. Uh, in the deep freeze. Now, we're not getting snow right now, so that's good, but it is cold with a capital C. Well, I tell you what, um, we are, like I said, we're in lesson number eight tonight of our, of our series, Journey Through Revelation. Uh, our title tonight is Letting God Do Extraordinary Things Through Ordinary You. Praise the Lord. This is our message tonight, I got to tell you. And, uh, of all the seven churches, and I said this last time, it is the Church of Philadelphia, I believe, that we should most emulate. And I think we'll see why as we uh, look at this letter from Jesus. We continue this week on our journey around the postal circuit of the seven churches to which this letter from Jesus, which was written down by the Apostle John and delivered to the angels, the angelos, the messengers of the seven churches. We've been looking at that, and we have come to Philadelphia this week, and we'll talk about that. Let's have a word of prayer over the word tonight, and then let's get into it. We've got a lot of good stuff, I believe, to look at. I believe it'll be a blessing to you. Father, we just thank you. For your holy written word, we thank you that you will open your word to us tonight by the blessed Holy Spirit. We can't journey through Revelation or any other part of your word apart from the agency and the ministry and the enlightenment of the illumination of the Holy Spirit. And so we believe you for that tonight. We just yield ourselves to you afresh and anew. We ask your blessing upon your people. There is a blessing promised to those who read and hear and do this book. And so we declare that that blessing is released on your people in this series that we're going through. Now, Father, we just give this time to you, give ourselves to you. And we believe this time is blessed in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. amen. Now, in our last <clears throat> lesson, uh, we visited the church at Sardis, and we saw there the church, or a church, uh, that needed to rekindle their spiritual fire. Now, this week, we visit the church at Philadelphia. Now, 
the name Philadelphia. Now, we're not talking about, of course, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. We're talking about Philadelphia, the ancient um, city in Asia Minor, of course. But the name Philadelphia is composed of two Greek words that, uh, that combine to mean brotherly love. Now, even, Pencil even uh, Pennsylvania, or Pitts no, come on, Kevin, spit it out. Even Philadelphia. <laughs> Whew. Even Philadelphia, Pennsylvania is known as the city of brotherly love because really that's what this word Philadelphia, the compound Greek word that makes this uh, city's name, uh, it, it, it's composed of two Greek words that combine to mean brotherly love. Philadelphia, now just giving you some geography here, was located about 28 miles south of Tartus. Uh, Sardis, rather. Wow. I tell you, uh, let's read from, once again, like we've been doing, uh, the Perry Stone Hebraic Prophetic Study Bible New Testament Edition. We're going to read Perry's notes, what he said about the church at Philadelphia. So let's uh, take a look at that right now. Oh, let's see here. Um, he's commenting on um, verses uh, 7 through 13, I believe, which is our focus tonight. Yeah. He says, the city of Philadelphia was located at the foot of a mountain plateau in the area today known as West Central Turkey. It was built on an important travel route linking the city with Laodicea to the south. In AD 17, an earthquake struck the area destroying much of the city, which was later rebuilt with the assistance of Emperor Tiberius. Winemaking, wool production, and agriculture were primary industries of the city. That's the city of Philadelphia. And again, that from the Perry Stone Hebraic Prophetic Study Bible New Testament. Um, the church at Philadelphia was small and had neither wealth nor prestige. In fact, the city of Philadelphia itself was a small city. Uh, the earthquake that destroyed Sardis in AD 17 that Perry referred to in his notes was also devastating to Philadelphia. Because this area was prone to earthquakes and tremors, much of the population lived outside the city walls. And, you know, when, when an earthquake would come through, they, were be, they would be driven from their homes, they'd be driven from the city, and so it got to a point that, again, most of the population lived outside the city. Today, al Turkey exists on the ancient site of Philadelphia. This ancient church is a fitting example, by the way, of how to let God do extraordinary things through ordinary you by remembering three things about Jesus. And a good evening there to Brother Sean, who just popped in and said, Hi, PK. Blessings to you, my friend. Um, something I was reading here in this book we've been referring to, Seven Letters to Seven Churches by Brian McCollum, he mentions here, and I, uh, let's see, I think it was right here. Yeah. Of all the churches, I found this interesting. He says, of all the churches addressed in Revelation, this is the only one. That is the church at Philadelphia. This is the only one, check this out, still alive today. The modern uh, city, like we said a moment ago of al here. um, Turkey, uh, population 20,000, still has a Christian bishop and more than 1,000 practicing Christians within that city. So wow. that, that, that ancient city of Philadelphia is a modern western Turkey city today, and the church that was founded there so many years ago is still alive. Now you can't say that about any of the other of the seven churches, but the church at Philadelphia remains today. I find that fascinating. Praise the Lord. But, but uh, learning how God can do extraordinary things through ordinary you, again, we said that is by remembering three things about Jesus. I want to suggest to you, first of all, that involves remember, to remember Jesus' power. 
Look at verse 7 of Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3, verse 7, and, and of course John wrote here as Jesus dictated this letter, and to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth, and no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth. Well, Jesus describes himself to this church. Now let's look at that description. First of all, he says, from him who is holy. Now, holy translates the Greek word hagios, and it means separate, it means undefiled, it means set apart. The holiness of Jesus, folks, who is, by the way, God in flesh and blood, is our model. In fact, uh, 1 Peter 1.15 talks about this. Let's hold our place just a moment here in Revelation chapter 3. And let's go over here to 1 Peter just a few pages back. Chapter 1, verse 15, and let's see what the word says. Amen. 1 Peter 1.15, the Bible says this. But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. And that word conversation really means manner of life. Now usually when we say conversation in modern vernacular, we mean two or more people having a discussion. That's a conversation. But in, in King James English, that word conversation meant manner of life. So anyway, but, but he says, be ye holy, the Lord says, for I am holy. In other words, you be separate, you be set apart, you be undefiled by the world because I am. Well, first of all, he's holy, but he also says he's true. He's true. Now, that means he is authentic, genuine, and trustworthy. Hey, aren't you glad that Jesus is authentic, genuine, and trustworthy. Amen. Why? Because the Greek word true translates that Greek word um, aletheinos, and it describes one who is trustworthy. Check this out. Because they cannot lie. <laughs> Praise Whoa. the Lord. He is true in all he says and does. Jesus is. Our Lord is. Our Messiah is. All right. Christ's awesome power is seen also. Now we can kind of understand when he says, he that is holy, he that is true. We can kind of get an understanding of that. But that's not all he said. Christ's awesome power is also seen when he says that he is the one that hath the key of David. Now what does that mean? Now remember we said that Revelation is the most Old Testament, New Testament book books with over 235 references, direct references to the Old Testament and over 800 allusions to the Old Testament in the book of Revelation. Now, talking about this key of David, we want to get an understanding of this because this harkens back to Isaiah 22:22, 22, 22, when Eliakim is given the key to the house of David during the reign of Hezekiah. Now, this gave, check this out, this gave Eliakim access to all the wealth and the power of the king. The key of David refers to Christ's power and authority. Now, again, I wanted to read from this book, Seven Letters to Seven Churches, because he comments on this as well. Let me see if I can find this part. Yeah, here it is. Um, let's see. He says here, um, keys symbolize, this is what I wanted to see, keys symbolize control and authority. If you have the keys to doors, you can lock them or open them. You can open them or shut them. You can determine what's open and what's shut. Jesus has the key of David. All the enemies of God's people have been defeated. Not some of them, all of them. And he writes here, they're totally defeated. Praise the Lord. Yeah, keys symbolize power 
and authority. Now, uh, something else that's in this little book by Dr. Chuck Missler, The Seven Letters to the Seven Churches, he says something about this uh, title for Jesus, he who has the key of David. He says, this is a remarkable set of titles for Christ. He is holy. We know that Jesus is the Holy One. We know that He is true. He is the true God, and He is truth itself. These are easy to comprehend. However, when He says, He that hath the key of David, what does that mean? And again, as I mentioned, this is, he says this is a direct reference to Isaiah 22, in which God sends Isaiah to speak to Shebna, the treasurer, and warns him that his days are numbered because of his own self-aggrandizement. God is going to replace Sheba with Eliakim. We meet these two characters later in Isaiah 36, uh, when Sennacherib's armies besieged Jerusalem. I'm not going to read all that scripture right now. But here's what else he says. This is, he refers to Isaiah 22, 20 through 23, and he says, The key that hung over Eliakim's shoulder provided him with the power to give access to the king. He chose when to unlock the door and whom to let into the king's throne room. This is not a permanent situation for Eliakim, but it is a permanent position for Jesus, the son of David. The government is committed into Jesus' hands as promised by scriptures like Isaiah 9, 6, and 7, and Luke 1, 32, and 33, and all authority is given unto him. He has the power to make things happen. Now check this out. He has the power to make things happen according to his purposes and his will. Boy, that's good. Whether a door is opened or locked up tight is up to him. Now, it's not up to you. It's not up to me. It's not up to other people. It's not up to circumstances. It's not up to the government. It's not up to any power in the world. It is up to Jesus alone. He is the one who has the authority to open doors, check it out, that no man can open and shut doors that no man, uh, cl close doors that no man can open and open doors that no man can close. That's what I was trying to get out. Jesus, he goes on to say, Jesus has the authority to open and shut doors, and he lets the church of Philadelphia know that they have access to what they need from God. My, my, my. Philadelphia is a missionary church, and he will make their path straight, so to speak. They have kept his word, and they haven't denied his name. Whew. Powerful, powerful, powerful. Amen. Well, that's what the Bible says about Jesus. Now, therefore, what does Jesus say? He is the one who opens doors. Now, initially, he opened the door of salvation. We know that. He opened the door of salvation to us and let us in, praise God, that we could receive him. But not only that, he opens doors of ministry opportunities. He opens doors of utterance. He opens, uh, he, he's the one who opens doors of business prospects. He is the way maker. He is the miracle worker. Now, Amen. right on the other hand, check this out. He shuts or closes other doors. If we will trust him and follow the leading of the Holy Spirit, he will get you and me in the right place at the right time and keep you out of the wrong place. Therefore, when we feel, folks, like God can't accomplish much through us because we don't have great talents, we need to remember Moses at the burning bush. He tells God he isn't an eloquent speaker and is slow of speech. Check out how God replies over there in Exodus chapter 4. Hold your place again in Revelation 11. Let's turn back to the Torah. Let's turn back to the book of Exodus, or as it is in the Hebrew Bible, Shemot. Um, but let's go back here to Exodus chapter 4, verses 10 and 11. Praise the Lord. Let me get there myself. 
All right, here's what the Bible says. And Moses said unto the Lord, O my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither here, uh, neither heretofore, nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. Now, somebody says, wait a minute. Hadn't Moses been in Egypt being groomed to be the next Pharaoh? He had to be a very powerful man, had to have a great command of speech. What has happened? Well, I'll tell you what has happened. From that time until this, remember he had killed the Egyptian, fled from Pharaoh because Pharaoh wanted to kill him and have him killed, and he ran to the desert of Midian. He'd been with Jethro, uh, who became his father-in-law, for 40 years by this time, and he had been primarily talking to sheep, okay, for 40 years. Now, you will lose some of your speech capabilities if you're doing nothing but talking to sheep for 40 years. Well, that's what <laughs> Moses had done. But look what it says in verse 11. And the Lord said unto him, Who hath made man's mouth? Or who maketh the dumb, or deaf, or the seeing, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? In other words, he says, he says to Moses, he says, Moses, I'm not working on your stuff. I'm working on my stuff. I am going to be with your mouth. I will anoint your mouth, in essence, he's saying. He says, I'm not dependent on what you have or don't have. All I'm doing is calling on you to trust me and do what I say. Amen. Wow. So think about that if you feel, well, you know, God really can't do anything through me. Um, you know, but God says, I'll be with your mouth, he said to Moses. Hallelujah. Well, in our day, check this out, in our day of mega churches and big name pastors with huge TV ministries, and thank God for them, not speaking disparagingly of that, but those of us who serve in smaller churches can sometimes be discouraged. Can I tell you that? Oh, yeah. And, and, and people, uh, check, you know, check this out. People will come to you and they'll watch these, you know, big mega churches on television or on YouTube or whatever the case. And they'll come to you and say, oh, pastor, I want our church to be like, and, and name any given number of big, huge churches you want to name. Name any powerful, you know, famous pastor you want to name. And they'll say, we want our church to be like that. We want our church to be like so-and-so's church. Well, and so you can become discouraged. But here's what I want you to know. And here's what Jesus, I believe, wants us to know. Jesus wants us to, wants us to know that our spiritual success is not measured by the size of the church we attend or serve in or our personal abilities. Spiritual success is determined by His power. Amen. Okay? His Amen. power. His power. What <laughs> matters is not the size of your church, or your spiritual gifts. Here's the bottom line. What matters is the size of your God. In other words, yes. or in the words of the old hymn, I should say, little is much when God is in it. Little is much when God is in it. Hallelujah. Yes. Amen. Now, don't feel cheated, therefore, because you don't attend a mega church with a famous pastor. Instead, feel blessed that you serve the Lord, serve the all-powerful Lord Jesus, who has the key of David. When you wonder what God can do with ordinary you or your small church, remember this fact about God. Written in 1 Corinthians 27b, and I always remember when I think of this scripture, I always remember my old friend, Brother Vern Starling, who is gone now. He, uh, he, he, he left and moved to heaven a number of years ago. But uh, he always said, and this was a, his paraphrase on this verse, he would say, God's biggest gift, uh, excuse me, God's biggest game in town. That was his terminology, not mine. He would say, God's biggest game in town is to bring strength out of weakness. Yes. Yeah. Strength yes. 
out of weakness. Well, this is what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 27, uh, 1 Corinthians 1, pardon me, 27b. He says, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Yes. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. Now listen to the same verse in the Amplified Classic Edition. No, for God selected, deliberately chose what in the world is foolish to put the wise to shame and what the world calls weak to put the strong to shame. Praise the Lord. So, to let God do extraordinary things through ordinary you, remember Jesus' power. But that's not all. And remember Jesus' perspective. Look at verse 8. Verse 8 says, I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, Jesus says, Here I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Well, there's a lot there, so let's see if we can get through all of that. There are four things I want you to notice that Jesus says that he knows, and remember, this is to see and know, to know exactly, completely, and thoroughly, he says he knows four things about this church. First of all, he says, I know thy works. Works there translates that little Greek word ergon. Ergon, this is work, it is labor, or it is performance. So Jesus says, I know your work, I know your labor, I know your performance. Okay? Then he says, you are of little strength. Now, little translates the Greek word my cross, or it's actually may cross, is, is the better pronunciation, may cross. In this context, it would mean little in quantity. Now, that would be the exact opposite of megas, which is large. Think mega, okay? It's the opposite of that. And he says, you are of little strength. Strength here is the Greek dunamis, and used in this way here, it refers to ability or achieving power. So he says, you have just a little bit of ability, just a little bit of achieving power. All the words, interestingly enough, in Greek deriving from that stem duna, duna, speak of strength or ability. Now, we're not going to get into a lot of Greek grammar and all that right here, but just know that the words that come from that stem, duna, all speak of strength or ability. But not only that, he says, I know your works, I know that you are of little strength, but he says, and you have kept my word. Kept his word. Now, kept translates the Greek word tereo, tereo, and it is the word, interestingly enough, for a guard or a warden. Now, i got to tell you, a guard in a prison, if you've ever been in a prison, and I've told you before, I have had the blessed privilege of ministering in several of the men's prisons here in the state of Iowa. I've been my great privilege to minister to those guys. I believe it's the heart of God, and, and I, I, I've, I've been there. But, but i got to tell you, the guards and the wardens, they watch those guys all the time. They keep an eye on them around the clock. There are guards walking around the hallways of those prisons 
day and night, keeping an eye on those prisoners. And this is the word he uses when he says, you have kept my word, te reo, like a warden or a guard. You've kept an eye on it. You've kept it in front of your eyes, praise God. And, and he says, it, you, you, you've watched it. You've kept an eye on it. And he says, you've not denied my name. Fourthly, this speaks of giving up on or rejecting. He says, you've not given up on or you've not rejected my name. And because all of this, Jesus says that he has set before them an open door. Now, this little church, check it out, was going to be given the opportunity to reach their city and possibly their region with the gospel. Because he said, even, all, even though all these things are true about you, I, Jesus said, have set before you an open door. What Jesus says about this church doesn't mean, by the way, that they were weak in faith, but they were small in number and resources. Now, the believers in Philadelphia were faithful followers of Christ because they kept his word and did not deny his name despite, by the way, enduring the same terrible persecution the other churches were facing. They didn't have it on easy street, so to speak. No, they were facing the same stuff that the other churches were. Therefore, they could say as Job in Job 23, 12, neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. That's the church in Philadelphia. Our Lord next says, Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. You know, it, it, it's amazing to me. Um, now, I, I can't say that I have looked in every study Bible and every commentary in existence, okay? But I got to tell you, I have studied this out in a good number of study Bibles and reference works and commentaries, and invariably, commentators or notes in Bible study Bibles will say that Jesus here was referring to a group of Jews who were persecuting the church. That's what they'll say. However, I must take exception with that, and I differ. And the only commentary that I read, by the way, that got this, in my opinion, correct was the complete Jewish commentary by David Stern. He gave this what I'm going to tell you here, and I believe it's the correct interpretation of this. Why? Because the text says they say they are Jews. It didn't say they are Jews. He didn't say they were Jews. He said they, are, they say they are Jews, but they are not and do lie. So the synagogue of Satan here refers, check this out, to Gentile believers who took on Jewish practices, even claiming to be Jews, and opposed and persecuted the church, telling believers to be saved, they had to be circumcised and keep the law. Groups like this popped up often in the early church. Paul dealt with a group like this in Galatia, and they were a problem in other churches, but these were non-Jewish believers, Gentiles, if you will, who claimed to be Jews, but they weren't. The text very clearly says they claim to be Jews, but they are not. And so why the commentators say, well, these were Jews? No. And, and I know the argument they make, okay? They go back to what Paul said. He said, not all who are of Abraham are of Jews, and in, in other words, he basically taught that a, if we could use the terminology, a completed Jew was one who had received Yeshua Jesus as Messiah. Okay, so that's the argument they make. These were not really Jews because they had rejected Messiah. Still, I have to say, based on church history and what was going on at the time in the world, the church world, the early church, that just as the text says, these people said they were Jews and were 
not. All right. Praise the Lord. All right. Now, Jesus says, of them, Jesus says, I should say, Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. This is part of what will probably happen when Jesus comes again. When Paul writes in Philippians, he says, In that day every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of of Amen. God the Father. Yeah. Now the Lord continues, because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Now I have to tell you, from a dispensational interpretation this is one layer here. The church at Philadelphia represents the remnant church or the true church, if you will, throughout the ages. And he says, I will keep thee from the hour of temptation. So this promise really extends beyond the church of Philadelphia to all believers of all times. And, and here's the thing. Um, I know I have friends and I have brethren of mine who teach that the church will go through the great tribulation. I, I know that is, a, that is a teaching that is out there. Um, I don't believe, I, I, don't, I don't accept that. I don't believe that. I believe that before the onset of the tribulation, before the, uh, for the uh, revealing of the Antichrist and all of that, the church will first be caught up to meet the Lord in the air and literally kept from that hour of temptation because... If you look at that text again, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation. A lot of teachers will say that that means in the midst of. I will keep thee in the midst of, but you cannot correctly translate this. I will keep thee in the midst of because what appears in the Greek text is the little Greek preposition ek. Ek, and it means from or out of. And so, in essence, Jesus said, I will keep thee from or deliver you out of the time of the hour of temptation, rather, which shall come upon all the earth. I think that's referring to the great tribulation. That's the point. And Jesus says, I will keep thee from, I will deliver thee out of. That's the only way you can really translate that Greek preposition, ek. Uh, if he had meant something else, he would have used another preposition. But what appears in the Greek text is ek, and it means from or out of. Anyway, I tend to believe that it looks ahead to the future Great Tribulation described in chapters 6 through 19. I say this largely because of what Jesus says in verse 11. He says, Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Now, what does quickly mean? Well, the word quickly, and we saw this back in, uh, back in chapter 1, I believe we saw this word, and this word quickly translates the Greek word takas, takas, and it, and it means fast, it means speedily, it means suddenly, uh, and all of that, but it is, it's, it's really, check this out, Jesus says, I, am, I come quickly, it's really a matter of perspective because when the Lord uses the word quickly, it has a different meaning than it does to us. You know, we use calendars and we use watches every day. Well, most of us, you know, check the time on our phones anymore, but I mean, you know, a lot of folks still wear watches as well, but, but we use calendars and all of that. And uh, we are essentially caught in this thing called time. You know, I, I explained it before. You know, you can't see too far that way. You can't see too far that the other way. You're pretty much just locked in to what's in front of you at the moment. And uh, we're caught in time. But you see, Jesus is not 
caught in time. He dwells in eternity. He dwells in the realm where one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. So, from his perspective, he's only been gone a couple days. <laughs> think about it. So anyway, that, that's a what largely what it is. It's perspective. But our Lord continues, hold fast uh, which thou hast that no man take thy crown. Now crown here speaks not of salvation, but it speaks of rewards. Okay. Um, there are several different types of rewards called crowns in the New Testament. Examples are the crown of life in James 1.12 and the crown of glory in 1 Peter 5.4. I think here the crown Jesus describes here is probably the crown described in 2 Timothy 4.8 when Paul wrote, he said, he says, I give to you the crown of life, but not, un, not unto thee only, but unto all them that love my appearing. So I think he's probably talking about the crown of life. Now, because of Jesus' perspective, he not only knows what is going on in our lives right now, but also how all things began and how all things are going to end. He knows it all. Amen. Amen. Well, to let God do extraordinary thing, things through ordinary you, remember Jesus' power, Number two, remember his perspective, Jesus' perspective. And thirdly, remember Jesus' plan. Look at verse 12 and 13. He says, He that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, he says in verse 13, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Now Jesus concludes this letter with a word of comfort about his final plan for all faithful believers. He says, He that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. Now, pillar speaks of stability and authority. Stability and authority. And the temple of my God refers to heaven or the eternal household of the redeemed. The, the, the promise really, I got to tell you, was a direct comfort, historically speaking, um, the promise really was a comfort to these Philadelphian believers because it symbolizes permanence and stability. And they hadn't known that, you see, because historically speaking, these believers lived in constant fear of earthquakes and tremors that would destroy their homes, driving them out of the city. They and we also are comforted, though, by knowing we will have a wonderful, permanent, by the way, safe home in the new Jerusalem in heaven. Amen. Now, now somebody says, well, now, Pastor, do, do you really believe all that? Yeah, I do. Amen. I believe what the Bible says. Amen. And so, uh, and, I, and I believe you should too. But anyway, anyway, um, they, uh, let's see here. Summarizing, here's where I wanted to go. Psalm 3120, Isaiah 52 or 52, 15, 64, 4, and 65, 17. What does Paul write about God's wisdom over in 1 Corinthians 2, 9? Well, let's look at it. Hold your place in Revelation 3, and let's go back over here to 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 9. Praise the Lord. Now, usually we just read part of this. But let's, we're going to read it all. He says, But as it is written, I hath not seen, 
nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. And a lot of people just stop reading there and say, oh, yes, we don't know what, what's going to happen in the end, we, but it will be revealed in heaven. We never know what God's going to do, but he'll show us someday because I has not seen nor ear heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things God has prepared for them that love him. But wait a minute, he didn't stop there because verse 10 says, but God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit for the spirit searcheth all things yea the deep things of god so there it is uh the holy spirit watch this the holy spirit wisdom helps us to understand and to interpret spiritual truths found in the bible don't try to read the word merely in your intellect and in your ability in yourself to grasp it no we need beloved the hope the help of the holy spirit to understand the word the holy spirit is the one who unveils who opens up who shows us these things amen that's what jesus said he came to do but this is important especially i don't mind telling you as we study the book of Revelation, and I also don't mind telling you this, I don't think that there is any more important book of the Bible to be studying right now than the book of Revelation. We are living in the time when the, the things that the prophets wrote of, the things that Jesus said would come, the things that are revealed in the New Testament, they are beginning to come forth. They, the world is being conditioned for the revealing of the man of sin and the establishment of the beast system. And I think it's very important for we as believers to be studying these things at this time. You see, the book of Revelation contains many truths, uh, spiritual truths, and coming judgments, and heaven that can only be understood, I don't mind telling you, by those who have the wisdom that comes from God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Not only will believers be a pillar in God's temple in heaven, but also our Lord says, and he shall go no more out. This was a special comfort to the believers at Philadelphia. The comfort continues, and I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. These names symbolize ownership, okay? like a brand on cattle identifies the owner. Jesus writing the name of God and the name of the city of my God on us identifies us as belonging to God. Hallelujah. We belong to God. Amen. We belong to God. You might think that you don't belong in the world, but I'm here to tell you, we belong to God. That's what the Word says. Our Lord says He will write on believers His new name. This suggests that in heaven we will know the glorified Christ as He really is. In this life, we can never fully comprehend the glorified Savior and all of His heavenly splendor. Therefore, you know, 1 John 3, 2 tells us that, that when Jesus appears at that time, we shall see him as he is because we shall be like him. Yeah. Amen. That's yeah. what the word says. Hallelujah. Now, like all the other letters to the churches, this letter concludes with the warning to hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. Now, I got to tell you, 
it is extremely important that you are listening to the Holy Spirit, that you put yourself in a position to hear the voice of the Spirit, to pick up on the Spirit's directive, to pick up on the Spirit's guidance. And I tell you, a real good hearing aid, if you will, is God's Word. Spend time in God's Word. Spend time reading the Word. Spend time meditating the Word. Spend time getting the Word on the inside of you because I got to tell you, the Word of God is the language that the Holy Spirit speaks. Now, now you need to get, get a hold of that. The Word is the language that the Holy Spirit speaks. And He says, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. I believe that God is speaking. Primarily, God speaks through his word. But I'm here to tell you, God will also speak to you as an individual believer. And what he will do is he will take a word from the word. That's why it's important to hide the word in your heart. He will take a word from the word when you need it in a specific situation and he will bring that word up in your spirit and that lagos word uh, that comes from the grafe word which is the written word the lagos is the uh, is the thought of god well when he brings up out of your spirit that word that you've hidden in your heart and you speak that out of your mouth, that becomes the rhema word, the spoken word. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And our sister says, what a neat analogy. Hearing aid for the Holy Spirit is the word of God. Amen. It, it, it's an aid for our spiritual hearing. Glory to God. Glory, glory to God. Hallelujah. Well, to let God do extraordinary things through ordinary you, remember Jesus' power, Jesus' perspective, and Jesus' plan. Hallelujah. Well, I got to tell you, we've got one more lesson in Revelation chapter 3. Next time, we will look at Jesus' message to the church at Laodicea. And uh, we will learn how to not make Jesus sick. <laughs> you don't want to make Jesus sick. But I got to tell you, the believers in Laodicea, Jesus said they made him sick because they were neither hot nor cold. They were lukewarm. And so we'll, uh, we'll examine that um, letter uh, from Jesus to that church, Lord willing, uh, next time. Well... Let's go back here and uh, greet some of our folks who've been with us. We kind of said hi to a few as we've gone here, but let's just give proper greetings at the end. Our sister Nancy's out there. Uh, Brenda, bless you, sister. Um, our good brother, Sean. Uh, and let's see, sister Diane, thank you for being there. Sister, brother Tom. Tammy, uh, thank you for being there, sister. Blessings to you. We appreciate um, all of you being there and others who may have popped in here or there they just maybe didn't you know let us know of their presence but we we appreciate all who uh, join us on these sessions uh, for these sessions i should say on wednesday night now if you have any other comments or questions or words of testimony or prayer requests or whatever you might have go ahead and chat those in right now want to let you know about service Sunday at the Boone Church of God of Prophecy. We meet at 10 o'clock on the corner of 21st and Crawford. I think they've given us a street name, a number now. I think it's like 2128 Crawford, whatever the case. Anyway, I always say we're on the corner of 21st and Crawford right across from Franklin School here in Boone. And uh, we meet at 10 o'clock. We'd love to have you uh, come out and join us in person. We'd love to fellowship with you uh, in the presence of the Lord around the Word of God. And uh, this coming Sunday, we plan on um, having our communion observance. Now, last 
uh, in January, we didn't uh, get to have our community observance because we were actually closed on the first Sunday of the month due to weather, so we didn't have our communion observance, but uh, we plan on having our communion observance the first Sunday of the month this month for February, uh, this Sunday. Also, Lord willing, I will be continuing on with my new series on signs you will see just before Jesus comes. Signs you will see just before Jesus comes. And this week we're going to look at the number one sign that Jesus gave to let us know how late in time prophetically we really are. So uh, come out if you can. We'll, we'll be looking at that in the Word of God. Um, you know, 10 o'clock at the church. If you can't be there, of course, where you participate in this Bible study on Wednesday night, uh, you can catch on my Facebook uh, news feed the ch uh, church service live streamed as well. If you cannot be with us uh, in person, in-house, then uh, by all means uh, take advantage of the live stream that we offer. We're glad to be able to do that, honestly. So praise the Lord. That's, that's wonderful. You know, a number of years ago, if we were in a situation because of health or maybe someone has a, you know, a compromised immune system with all the stuff going on around, you know, right now health-wise, you know, if this would have been back in the 70s or 80s or even farther back than that when we didn't have all the technology that we have now, uh, we'd have just been, you know, cut off from each other, not really had a way to, you know, meet and all that. But now with this technology, we can offer live stream services and teachings and all of that. It's just kind of cool um, what the Lord has done in this hour, I think. Well, anyone else have any comments or questions, go ahead and get those in now. Uh, if not, we'll go ahead and bring tonight's session to a close. But I wanted to, you know, if you did have anything else, to get that in just before we do that. I'm going to take a drink of coffee here. My coffee has become a good illustration of the church at Laodicea. Because sitting here on the table, my coffee is no longer hot, it's not cold, it's lukewarm. But I'm not going to spew it out of my mouth, so that we, we don't have to, you know, we're not going to do that. But I, I just thought, wow, that's a good, you know, illustration. But anyway. If for, you do, you have to clean it yeah, up. Yeah, if I do, I'd have to clean it up and it'd probably <laughs> spit all over the table and the computer. And nah, I don't want to do that. So praise the Lord. <laughs> Amen. Well, it's been... Pastor Kevin and Joyce Ann here again uh, with you tonight. We thank you for joining us. And now we just say, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. We do bless you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. And I want to remind you, as we do each week, of these words from 1 John chapter 5 and verse 4. Whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even, even our, our faith. faith. The Lord bless you. We'll see you soon.